Hello, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, we are going to discuss the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 18th February 2019. The news to be discussed has been presented on the screen and time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. Now, let's start our today's discussion. Now, the first news appears in the editorial section on page number 8. It says, Delhi Dilemma. Supreme Court split decision flags the need to address complexities in the central union territory ties. So this editorial highlights about the complex relations between the central government as well as the Delhi government over various administrative issues pertaining to the national capital territory of Delhi. This editorial highlights about the recent judgment of the Supreme Court where it addresses six different issues. So let's see those six different issues and also the concept of National Capital Territory of Delhi because we know that two questions have been asked in the mains examination in GS Paper 2. This question was asked in the year 2016 pertaining to the essentials of 69th constitutional amendment and this particular question was asked in the year 2018 which asked whether the Supreme Court judgment of July 2018 can settle the political tussle between the Lieutenant Governor and elected government of Delhi. Examine. So we understand that this entire growing acrimonious relation between the central government as well as the Delhi government has become very important from our examination perspective. So let us understand this entire issue in detail. So the whole contention in this entire issue is over supremacy of Delhi with respect to its administration. Because Delhi is primarily a union territory, however, it also has a government, that is, it also has a state legislative assembly. So, we can say that Delhi is not like other states which enjoys entire power as given in the state list under the 7th schedule to the Indian constitution. So, based on this fact that Delhi is primarily a union territory having a state legislative assembly, so there are certain slugfests with respect to certain administrative issues between the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi as well as with the Chief Minister and his Council of Ministers. On this note, let us first of all understand certain basic facts with respect to Delhi. Then we'll try and understand about the various issues which was addressed by the two-judge bench of the Supreme Court. So as per Article 239AA of the Indian Constitution, which was added by Constitution 69th Amendment, the Union Territory of Delhi shall be the National Capital Territory of Delhi and the administrator appointed under Article 239 shall be designated as the Lieutenant Governor. Further, it says that there shall also be a legislative assembly for the National Capital Territory of Delhi and seats in such assembly shall be filled by members chosen by direct election from the territorial constituencies in the National Capital Territory. So, this is basically the constitutional provision provided under Article 239AA for the National Capital Territory of Delhi, where it categorically says that Delhi shall be a union territory having a legislative assembly. Further, with respect to making powers for Delhi government, it says that the Delhi legislative assembly shall have power to make laws for the whole or any part of the National Capital Territory with respect to matters contained in state list or in the concurrent list. However, there are certain restrictions. It says that Legislative Assembly of Delhi cannot make laws on the following entries under state list. Now, this important fact becomes very important to understand from your prelims perspective and also to understand because one of the issues raised in this judgment is based on entry 18 under state list that is with respect to land. So, as per the law, the Delhi government cannot make laws on public order, police as well as land. So, it says that the government of Delhi does not enjoy all powers with respect to lawmaking which are enjoyed by other states. And moreover, National Capital Territory of Delhi is primarily a union territory having a legislative assembly. So, these are some of the basic facts with respect to union territory of Delhi. Further, this editorial also highlights about the constitution when judgment given last year with respect to the constitutional relation between the LG as well as the Delhi government comprising of the chief minister and its council of ministers. And this issue of Delhi LGCM controversy resolved by the Supreme Court was covered in the 2018 August edition of the Focus magazine. The five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court clarified that the elected government of Delhi cannot be undermined by an unelected administrator. 
सो दिस जजमेंट इफेक्टिवली रिस्टोर द प्राइमरी रोल प्लेड बाय द रिप्रेजेंटेटिव गवर्नमेंट इन द नेशनल कैपिटल टेरिटरी ऑफ दिल्ली फर्दर द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हेल्ड दैट अपार्ट फ्रॉम द सब्जेक्ट्स व्हिच आर नॉट विद इन द जुरिस्डिक्शन ऑफ दिल्ली गवर्नमेंट दैट इज पुलिस लैंड एंड पब्लिक ऑर्डर द एलजीस कंसेंट इज नॉट रिक्वायर्ड फॉर एवरी डिसीजन फर्दर ऑन द इशू ऑफ एड एंड एडवाइस द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हेल्ड दैट the lg must act on the aid and advice of council of ministers except when he decides to refer the matter to the president for final decision so effectively as per the supreme court the lg has no independent decision making power and he has to either act on the aid and advice of the council of ministers or he is bound to implement the decision taken by the president on a reference being made by him another important issue was with respect to this word of any matter supreme court held that the lg with pretext to referring any matter to the president cannot refer every matter to the president passed on to the lg by the chief minister or the delhi government thus the supreme court held that the power of lieutenant governor under the said provision represents the exception and not the general rule which has to be exercised in exceptional circumstances so the lg cannot refer every matter to the president for his reference as it will choke the day to day administration of delhi and on this note the supreme court held that the governance of delhi cannot rest upon the whims of one functionary namely the lieutenant governor as he cannot refer every matter of delhi government to the president as this will create work paralysis further the supreme court also cautioned the lg against sending every trivial or small dispute to the president and suggested that the lg must work harmoniously with his ministers that is with the ministers of delhi government and it is on this note that the supreme court advised both the chief minister and lg of delhi who holds constitutional post to work in a collaborative manner so as to fulfill the concept of collaborative federalism as this particular word also appears in the editorial in the end part so it is based on these aspects that the supreme court gave certain clarification with respect to functioning and administrative relation between cm as well as the lg of delhi so after understanding the core issues with respect to administration of delhi under article 239 aa of the indian constitution this particular editorial also highlights about the recent judgment of the division bench that is two judge bench of the supreme court of india so the recent decision of this two judge bench of the supreme court pertains to the following matters namely jurisdiction of anti corruption branch services appropriate government under the commission of inquiry act electricity reforms revision of minimum rate of agricultural land and power to appoint special public prosecutor now the issue of jurisdiction of anti corruption branch between the delhi government as well as the lg became a bone of contention as the lg replaced the chief of anti corruption branch in 2015 on this note the delhi government said that the lg acted on the behest of the central government however the supreme court held that the jurisdiction of anti corruption branch lies with the central government and the central government has jurisdiction over acb as well as to transfer its officers in the matter of defining appropriate government under the commission of inquiry act the supreme court ruled in favor of the central government that central government is the appropriate government with respect to delhi on the issue of electricity reforms the supreme court held that the delhi government enjoys jurisdiction over electricity reforms and other matters related to electricity now on the issue of revision of minimum rate of agricultural land we remember that land was beyond the purview of the delhi government to legislate however the supreme court ruled that delhi government has the power to revise the minimum rates of agricultural land and in case of differences over the rate of agricultural land the lg can refer the matter to the president now on the issue of power to appoint special public prosecutor the supreme court ruled in favor of the delhi government and said that the delhi government had the power to appoint special public prosecutor however one important issue remained that is services and on this the two judge were conflicted in their opinion now service is provided under entry 41 of the state list and it provides for state public services and state public service commission on this note 
both Justice Sekri and Justice Bhushan agreed that there is no service under the Delhi government and the civil servant working in Delhi are drawn from the Danic scatter which is common to all the union territory. Now Justice Sikri agreed that as per the constitution when judgment of last year, the national capital territory of Delhi would have power to deploy official in its own department. However, Justice Sikri held that the absence of public service in Delhi would imply that it is a matter inapplicable to union territory. So, LG of Delhi need not act on the aid and advice of the Delhi government. So, according to Justice Sikri, so transfer and postings of officers in the rank of joint secretary and above can be directly submitted to the LG without taking opinion of the Delhi government. And transfer and postings of other officers who are below the rank of joint secretary must be processed by the Council of Ministers of the Delhi government and then it can be submitted to the LG for its approval. However, in case of any dispute, the view of LG will prevail. However, according to Justice Bhushan, there was no service under the National Capital Territory of Delhi. Hence, there is no scope for the Delhi government to exercise any executive power with respect to transfer and posting of officers. So, because of the conflicting opinion between Justice Sikri and Justice Bhushan, a larger bench of the Supreme Court will decide on this issue of services. So, in this news analysis, we not only learnt about the Delhi government but also the constitution bench judgment given last year with respect to the cordial relationship between the LG and the CM of Delhi. So on this note, this particular editorial becomes extremely important for us to understand between the relationship between the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi and the Chief Minister and his Council of Ministers. As you can see, two questions in 2016 and 2018 have been asked directly on this particular issue. So with this, let's move on to our next news analysis. The next article also appears on page number 8. It says, how the 16th Lok Sabha fared. Important bills were passed, but going forward, there must be debate on the anti-defection law. So this article highlights about various aspects with respect to the 16th Lok Sabha. First of all, is with respect to decline in number of sitting days. Secondly, it says that legislative routes were bypassed by passing various acts as money bill. The article then highlights that finance bills were also passed as money bill. Then it says that anti-defection provision under the 10th schedule has allowed the majority government to act arbitrarily. And lastly, it also talked about some of the important legislations passed by the 16th Lok Sabha. So in this note, let us understand and analyze each of these aspects as highlighted by this author in this article. Now this topic in your prelims examination forms a part of Indian polity and governance and in your mains, it gets covered under GS paper 2, specifically under functioning of parliament, conduct of business, powers and privileges and issues arising out of all these. So we understand that this topic becomes very important from our examination perspective, both prelims as well as mains. Now pertaining to this article, these are the different questions which has been asked by UPSC in previous years. So we will go through each of these questions when we'll discuss each of those topics. The first point highlighted by the author in this article is with respect to decline in number of sitting days. It says that the 16th Lok Sabha met 40% less than the previous full-time parliaments. It says that the 16th Lok Sabha sat only for 331 days as compared to a 468 day average of all previous full-term Lok Sabhas. Another important aspect highlighted by the author is that the 16th Lok Sabha lost 16% of its time due to disruptions. Further, the Lok Sabha also lost its precious time with respect to question hour, where the Lok Sabha lost 33% and the Raj Sabha lost 60% of the time of question hour. Now, the first hour of every sitting of parliament is generally reserved for asking and answering of questions and this first hour is referred as question hour. Further, it says that parliamentary question is a technique of parliamentary surveillance over the functioning of the government where members of the parliament are free to ask questions in order to ascertain the functioning and performance of the government. Another important aspect is that the members of the government are bound to answer every question asked in the question hour. There is another concept known as zero hour. It says that time immediately following the question hour has come to be known as zero hour and it starts at around 12 noon. 
Now, this particular question was asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2017. The question was, the Parliament of India exercises control over the functions of Council of Ministers through adjournment motion, question hour, supplementary question. In this, the correct answer was D, that is all of the above. So, on the first point, the author has highlighted that there has been a decline in number of sitting days with respect to functioning of the 16th Lok Sabha. The second point highlighted by the author is that the government has passed various acts as money bill by bypassing the legislative route. And in this aspect, the author has said that the manner in which some of the bills were passed by the government is quite questionable. And the example taken by the author is with respect to the passing of Aadhaar Act as a money bill. Now, government resorts to passing of various bills as money bill because the Raj Sabha does not enjoy any power with respect to money bill. Now, Article 110 defines a money bill. It says that a bill shall be deemed to be a money bill if it contains only provisions dealing with all or any of the following matters, namely imposition, abolition, remission, alteration or regulation of tax or any aspect with respect to regulation of borrowing of money any aspect with respect to consolidated fund or the contingency fund of India, any aspect with respect to appropriation of monies out of the consolidated fund of India, declaration of any expenditure to be charged on the consolidated fund of India or receipt of money on account of consolidated fund of India or the public account of India. Further, this article says that any matter incidental to any of the matters as specified from clause A to clause F so this is what the constitution says about money bill. So if a bill contains any of the following, then it can be declared as a money bill by the speaker of Lok Sabha. An important aspect with respect to money bill is that a money bill can only be introduced in the Lok Sabha. The third point highlighted by the author is that various finance bills have been passed as money bill. Now finance bill under article 117 comprise of any of the provisions of money bill or any other matter relating to finance. So it says that a bill or amendment making provision for any of the matter specified in the money bill shall not be introduced or moved except on the recommendation of the president and a bill making such provision shall not be introduced in the council of states. Now for the sake of our understanding and clarity, finance bill can be categorized as finance bill A or finance bill 1 and finance bill B or finance bill 2. Now finance bill A can be introduced only in the Lok Sabha and it cannot be introduced in the Raj Sabha. Whereas Finance Bill B can be introduced either in Lok Sabha or in Raj Sabha. However, with respect to Finance Bill A, the moment Finance Bill A crosses from Lok Sabha to Raj Sabha, it becomes like an any other ordinary bill. Hence, Raj Sabha with respect to Finance Bill A gets all other power which it has with respect to any other ordinary bill. But the only fact is that the finance bill A cannot be introduced in Raj Sabha but can be introduced only in Lok Sabha on the prior recommendation of the President of India. However, the author in this article claims that there were various finance bills passed by this government which were not related to any expenditure of the government or related to any tax of the government. Some of the examples are the finance bill 2015 included provisions to merge the regulator of commodity exchange with Securities and Exchange Board of India. So provision to merge commodities exchange and SEBI were passed as a finance bill. Further, Finance Bill 2016 included amendments to the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act which relates to donation to non-profits. The finance bills of 2017 went further and changed the composition of 19 quasi-judicial bodies such as Securities Appellate Tribunal, National Green Tribunal, the Telecom Dispute Settlement and Appellate Tribunal and repealed seven other bodies including the Competition Appellate Tribunal through the Finance Bill. So the author claims that the government changed composition of regulatory bodies through Finance Bill. Further, even the Finance Bill of 2019 which was presented with the interim budget amended the provision relating to attaching of property under the money laundering law. So these were some of the claims made by the author with respect to passing of various finance bills which were not related to any expenditure or tax of the government. Now the fourth point highlighted by the author is that the anti-defection provision under 10 schedule has allowed the government to act in an arbitrary manner. 
The author highlights that the Triple Talaq Bill as well as Citizenship Amendment Bill could not be passed because the government did not enjoy majority in the Raj Sabha. Has the government enjoyed majority in Raj Sabha? Then every bill could have been passed as there would have been no opposition and no system of check and balances. So the article highlights about the absence of check and balances in case of a government which enjoys majority in both Lok Sabha as well as Raj Sabha. Now the author also talks about the anti-defection provision whereby the government can issue whip and it compels its members of parliament to vote according to the party line. Else, these members of parliament can be disqualified under the 10 schedule. So as per the law, a member of the house will be disqualified if he votes or abstains from voting in the house contrary to any directions issued by his political party without prior permission of such party. As you can see, the 10 schedule provides for provisions for disqualification on grounds of defection. So according to the 10 schedule, a person can be disqualified if he votes or abstains from voting contrary to any direction issued by the political party. So according to the author, this particular law with respect to 10 schedule has converted members of parliament from being representative of people to the delegates of the party. And it was based on this concept that this particular question was asked by UPSC in 2013. The question was, the role of individual MPs, members of parliament, has diminished over the years and as a result, healthy constructive debates on policy issues are not usually witnessed. How far can this be attributed to the anti-defection law which was legislated but with a different intention? So, we see that the issues highlighted by the author in this article have already been asked by UPSC with respect to anti-defection law in 2013. So, this idea expressed by the author where it says that representatives of people are converted into delegates of political party because of 10 schedule becomes an important aspect to understand. And the last point highlighted by the author is with respect to important legislations passed by this government. So, some of the important legislations passed by this government are GST that is Goods and Services Tax, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, the IIM Act 2017 which gives these institutions a level of autonomy which is not available to other public educational institutions. Further, the Juvenile Justice Act allows children between 16 to 18 years accused of committing heinous crimes to be prosecuted as adults. Further, various new acts were passed such as for treatment of mental health patients that is Mental Health Care Act 2017 and those with HIV AIDS. Another act was passed to ensure rights of persons with disabilities. Even Prevention of Corruption Act was amended to make bribe giving a serious offence. And considering the economic offences, the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018 was passed according to which declaration of assets held outside India must be disclosed and the act also allows for a person to be declared as fugitive economic offender if he has fled the country and not came back on prior summons by the court. So these can be said to be some of the important legislations passed by the government. So this article highlights diverse aspects with respect to the 16th Lok Sabha and this becomes extremely important from our mains perspective. So based on our discussions, there were other questions as well which have been already asked by UPSC in the mains examination. It says, should the premier institutes like IITs and IIMs be allowed to retain premier status, allowed more academic independence in designing courses and also to decide mode or criteria of selection of students, discuss in light of growing challenges. So again, this becomes important as the government has given autonomy to the IIMs. Further question was also asked on GST. It said that explain the salient features of Constitution 100 and First Amendment Act 2016 which pertain to goods and services tax. Do you think it is efficacious enough to remove cascading effect of taxes and provide for common national market for goods and services? So we understand that the issues highlighted in this article are extremely important from our examination perspective. Hence, we must read this article very carefully and understand every aspect as highlighted in five different points. So with this, let's move on to our next news discussion. The next news appears on page number 13. It says, States Allocation Panel Sticks to 2011 Census Proposals will impact central budget and those presented by states for the year 2020-21, says N.K. Singh, 
who is the chairman of 15th finance commission so the 15th finance commission headed by shri nk singh has said that it will stick to the 2011 census as mentioned in the terms of reference of 15th finance commission however in an interview shri nk singh said that those states that have performed well on controlling their population will not be penalized by the 15th finance commission now this topic of 15th finance commission and its term of reference becomes important as this was asked in 2018 in gs paper 2 the question was how is the finance commission of india constituted what do you know about the terms of reference of the recently constituted finance commission so we understand that this topic of 15th finance commission and its term of reference becomes extremely important for us to know as you can see this particular question was asked in the prelims of 2015 and it pertained to 14th finance commission so a question on 15th finance commission as well as on its term of reference can also be asked in your prelims examination also because of the fact that it has already been asked in the mains of last year so this question was with reference to the 14th finance commission which of the following statements is are correct first it has increased the share of states in central divisible pool from 32% to 42% yes the statement was correct second it has made recommendations concerning sector specific grants no the statement was incorrect so in this a was the correct answer so the mandate of 15th finance commission is that the commission shall review the current status of finance deficit debt levels cash balances and fiscal discipline efforts of union government as well as the state government the 15th finance commission shall also recommend a fiscal consolidation road map for sound fiscal management so the 15th finance commission shall recommend a fiscal consolidation road map for sound management of finances both for the union government as well as for the state governments further the finance commission shall also foster higher inclusive growth in the country and this higher inclusive growth shall be guided by the principles of equity efficiency as well as transparency further the commission shall also look into the revenue deficit grants that is whether such revenue deficit grants should be provided at all or not and one of the most important aspect as also highlighted by the interview of the chairman of 15 finance commission is that the commission shall use the population data of 2011 census while making its recommendation so these are some of the important mandates of the 15th finance commission further with respect to terms of reference the finance commission may consider proposing measurable performance based incentives for states at appropriate level of government in the following areas it says that efforts made by the states in expansion and deepening of tax net under gst shall also be considered further efforts and progress made in moving towards replacement rate of population growth shall also be taken into account also achievements in implementation of flagship schemes of the government of india disaster resilient infrastructure sustainable development goals and quality of expenditure shall also be taken care of by the 15th finance commission the 15th finance commission shall also take into account the increasing capital expenditure done by any state including elimination of loss of power sector and also improving the quality of expenditure in generating future income streams so while making its report the 15th finance commission shall take into account all these aspects with respect to increasing capital expenditure eliminating losses in the power sector as well as improving quality of such expenditure in generating future income streams further while making its report the 15th finance commission shall also take into account progress made by each state in increasing their tax as well as non tax revenues how far states have promoted savings by adopting direct benefit transfers as well as public finance management system how far have the states promoted digital economy how far the states have helped in removing layers between the government and the beneficiaries so the 15th finance commission shall take care all these aspect while making its report and recommendation further the commission shall also look into the provision of grants in aid to local bodies for basic services including quality human resources another important aspect as highlighted in the terms of reference is that the finance commission shall also look into the controlling or lack of incurring expenditure on populist measures that is how far have states incurred expenditure on populist measures 
Further, the terms of reference also include progress made in sanitation, solid waste management, and bringing in behavioral change to end open defecation. So, all these are terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission. So, the 15th Finance Commission shall recommend the fiscal policies for 5 years commencing from 1st April 2020. So, we understand that this news becomes important both from our prelims as well as from our mains perspective. With this, let's move on to our next news analysis. The next news appears on page number 7. It says, Caught down the wire, Punjab's black buck fight for existence. In this news analysis, let us learn certain basic facts with respect to this black buck as questions may be asked in your prelims examination with respect to its IUCN status. Now, this topic of black buck and its IUCN status gets covered under environment and geography. Now, it says that black buck is listed as least concerned under the IUCN red list as you can see in this picture. Another important aspect is that black buck is the state animal of Punjab. So, both these aspects becomes important from your prelims perspective. Further, black buck is listed in Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Further, this news highlights about this Abohar Wildlife Sanctuary which is situated in the state of Punjab. And these black bucks in this Abohar Wildlife Sanctuary are facing threats due to stray dogs, barbed wires as well as changing land use patterns. So, stray dogs, barbed cobra wire as well as change land use patterns has become as a threat for these black bucks. So, in this news analysis, you must remember that black buck has been listed as least concerned under IUCN red list and black buck is the state animal of Punjab. With this, let's move on to our next news analysis. The next news appears on page number 7. It says, Policies biased against rain-fed agriculture. Agriculture Atlas maps agro-biodiversities list differences. So, according to this news, first ever rain-fed atlas has been released which maps agro-biodiversity as well as socio-economic conditions prevailing in rain-fed agricultural areas. Further, this rain-fed atlas also attempts to document the policy biases that are making farming unviable for many of these areas. Now, this topic gets covered under environmental ecology as well as biodiversity. Now, the term rain-fed agriculture is used to describe such farming practices which rely on rainfall for their water uses. Now, rain-fed areas has contributed significantly to the country's food production as these rain-fed areas account for 89% of millet production, 88% of pulses production, 73% of cotton production, 69% of oil seeds production and 40% of rice production in the country. So, we can see that rain-fed areas as well as rain-fed agriculture contributes significantly to the Indian agriculture. Further, it says that rain-fed areas support 64% of cattle, 74% of sheep and 78% of goat population in the country. So, effectively, rain-fed areas not only help in supporting agriculture but also helps in feeding these cattle. Further, about 61% of India's farmers rely on rain-fed agriculture and 55% of the cross-cropped area is under rain-fed farming. So, we see there is a lot of contribution with respect to rain-fed agriculture as well as rain-fed areas contributing to Indian agriculture as well as cattle sheep rearing. It further highlights that India ranks first in rain-fed agriculture both in area and value of production. However, this report highlights that despite significant contribution of rain-fed areas as well as rain-fed agriculture, there is policy bias towards irrigated areas when it comes to public investment in agriculture by the Indian government. So, we can say that there is a bias towards irrigated areas and a bias against rain-fed areas. So, this effective neglect of rain-fed areas along with unsuitable program design has ensured that the potential of these rain-fed areas remains unrealized. So, the government must ensure proper realization of potential of these rain-fed areas sustaining rain-fed agriculture. Further, with respect to bias against rain-fed areas, this news highlights three important aspects. Basically, with respect to difference in income, difference in yield 
as well as policy bias. So on difference in income, it says that farmers in irrigated areas earned 60% of their income from agriculture, whereas their counterparts, that is farmers in rain-fed areas, earn only 20 to 30% from farm-related activities. So we can see there is a huge gap of difference in income between farmers who operate in irrigated areas as compared to those farmers who crop in rain-fed areas. Further, with respect to yield, it says that the average yield in rain-fed areas is about 1.1 tons per hectare and that in irrigated areas is about 2.8 tons per hectare. So, we can also see the difference with respect to yield between the rain-fed areas and the irrigated areas. Now, with respect to policy bias, this report highlights the difference with respect to government's expenditure. While the rain-fed crops such as coarse meals, millets, pulses, during the period of 2003-04 to 2012-13, the government expenditure was rupees 3,200 crore. Whereas for the other crops for the same period, that is from 2003-04 to 2012-13, the government expenditure was rupees 5,40,000 crore. So here we can see the huge difference in terms of policy bias with respect to government's expenditure on rain-fed crops and other crops. So the mapping of first ever rain-fed atlas shows the policy bias against rain-fed areas as well as rain-fed crops. So this news highlights that the first ever rain-fed atlas has been released which maps the agro-biodiversity as well as socio-economic conditions prevailing in rain-fed agricultural areas. And this atlas also attempts to document policy bias against the rain-fed farming. Now this news appears on page number 18. It says, scientists discover massive mountains under Earth's crust. They found the topography on layer located 660 km below the surface. Now in this news, scientists have discovered massive mountains in the Earth's mantle. And this data was collected from an enormous earthquake of magnitude 8.2 that occurred in Bolivia in 1994. Further, these mountains and other topography was found between the upper and the lower mantle. An important aspect of this discovery is that this will help in understanding the formation as well as evolution of earth. Now this topic in your prelims examination gets covered under general science as well as under geography. As you can see, this particular picture has been taken from your NCERT book. This picture highlights about mantle, core as well as the lithosphere which comprises of crust and the uppermost solid mantle. It says that the crust is roughly around 100 km thick, whereas the outer core is liquid and the inner core is solid. Now you can understand in detail about core, mantle as well as lithosphere in your NCERT books. As well as you can also download your PDF which will comprise of all these technical details. Now after our discussion, these forms your practice questions for the day. What you can do is to take a pause of 5 seconds. It says, the government of national capital territory of Delhi cannot make laws of which of the following? First, land. Second, police. Third, public order. Fourth, public health and sanitation. As per our discussion, it cannot make laws on land, police and public order. Whereas, it can make laws on public health and sanitation. So, in this, 1, 2 and 3 is the correct answer. That is D. The second question says, which of the following countries share its borders with Bolivia? The options are Chile, Brazil, Venezuela and Argentina. To answer this question, you must know about the map of Bolivia. As you can see in this map, Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Chile and Peru borders Bolivia. Whereas, Venezuela does not border Bolivia. So, in this question, Venezuela is the incorrect option. Hence, 1, 2 and 4 is the correct answer. So, here A is our correct answer. These two are your other practice questions. What you can do is also to take a pause of 5 seconds. Question number 3. It says, consider the following statements. First, first hour of every sitting of parliament is referred as zero hour. No, first hour of every sitting of parliament is referred as question hour. Second, question hour takes place after zero hour. No, it's reverse. First the question hour takes place and then zero hour takes place. 
so in this question both options are incorrect so here d is the correct answer moving to the next question it says consider the following statements about black buck first it is listed as vulnerable as per iucn red list no as per the iucn red list it is least concerned so the statement is incorrect second it is the state animal of punjab yes the statement is correct so in this b is the correct answer that is two only with this we come to an end to discussion of today's newspaper let's move on to the question for the day